Welcome back to the Hard Run Box podcast for episode nine. We have got a mixture of review feedback and news in this episode. So we'll be talking a little bit about Intel's 14th generation processors that uh, Steve nearly fell asleep while testing. We're going to be talking about AMD's anti-lag plus disaster that's happened across the past week, as well as their kind of weird launch of new RDNA 2 GRE GPUs at yeah, quite surprising price points. And then we do have as well a bit of a discussion on Threadripper 7000, the new Zen 4 Threadripper line that, yeah, we're thinking of upgrading to. And just a few of our interesting thoughts actually using Threadripper as a platform ourselves over the last few years. So, yeah, plenty to get to in this episode. Hope you enjoy it. Let's get to it. Steve, how are you doing? I hear that you've been busy today, very busy, which is why we're recording this podcast at 9 p.m., Yep. Yeah, a bit different to normal. Uh, yeah, well, the weather's been good, hasn't it? So I think I talked yes. about it at the end of the last podcast that I had some plans and today was the second day of executing those plans. So a lot of welding, um, fixing of color bond, which is kind of like corrugated sheet metal stuff. Anyway, there's some photos in the Harbour and Box Discord for those who are interested, but yeah. Big day uh, working outside and I didn't really want to stop doing the podcast. So I was like, you know what? Hopefully I have some energy at the end of the day and we can just do it then. So here we are. Yeah, I think it should be good. Yeah, we could talk more about your shed project at the end. But sure. um, yeah, very nice weather today. So I kind of wasn't too upset that you said that we should film it later in the day because I got mm -hmm. out and did some stuff myself as well. So yeah, very mm -hmm. nice. And now we're here to talk about... Well, let, let's get straight into it. Probably one of the most boring releases yep. that I have seen in some time, Intel's 14th generation CPUs, which as you put in your review, it's not really a generation, is it? It is very much no. just 13th gen. So what are yeah. these processes, Steve? Well, I mean, we, we've already encapsulated what this whole launch was. It was 13th gen again. Uh, well... The Core i7 14700K uh, or 14700, that got probably the E-Core configuration that it deserved. So that's 12 mm -hmm. instead of 8. So that that really does position it more centrally with the Core i5 and the i9. So that's good, I guess. Uh, probably based on current pricing, the 13700K is better value anyway. So that's not terribly exciting but yeah it's just a straight refresh which look we knew it was a refresh we were we were told by people in the know back at computex that you know it was a, it was a raptor lake refresh so okay that's not terribly exciting i guess when i was told that at the time no well they did tell us at the time it would be 14th gen didn't they i think so yeah, yeah they were talking I, about there was like a z790 uh refresh yeah. which so they weren't going to like z 890 and they're basically right. saying yeah these cpus are effectively the same but they're mm -hmm. going to be called like 14900k and so on yeah so i wasn't sure how accurate that was with the chipsets keeping their name i thought it might have been like you know an rdna two type refresh where we got like a 6750 xt so mm -hmm. like like a 13 you know 50 or something like that or 500 in that that instance but 14th gen I, I don't know i don't, don't really like those I don't, I don't like those refreshes that really it's just it is the same thing with a new name and that's pretty much what we got and i was hoping there'd be something there that they could do that would justify it being a 14th gen product which is obviously difficult to do with a refresh but yeah extremely underwhelming because you know like even the 14700k that kind of deserves to be called the 14700k in a way it's the same architecture and everything but it is it's, it's a, a fundamental, new configuration it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fundamental change with that product so that's not so bad but yeah then you get the 14600k the 14900k pretty much exactly the same product i mean it really is the same product any any software optimization type changes that are made with those products could be made to the 13th gen versions I, I don't know what else to say, Tim. <laughs> what were your observations? Well, I mean, yeah, I wasn't exactly expecting much. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess the issue with 13th gen 
not re- not that it was an issue really, but those chips are really pushed to the max. Like mm-hmm. there's no room for them to do anything with those processes. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they could just overclock them and release re-release them with you know a significant performance gain. Like I think we'd seen ma- maybe not so much on the desktop side, but certainly for mobile chips going back maybe five years ago now, we we would see refreshes where they would actually significantly increase the clock speeds or at least push mm-hmm. them up yeah to a reasonable level um between like the original version and the refresh version but with these desktop parts i mean they're they're basically overclocked out of the box like the power consumption of them is ridiculous they're pushing right up to six gigahertz already with some of the parts so there's like there's nothing they can do mm. with those products to make them exciting like the 100 to 200 megahertz extra clock speeds is like okay <laughs> cool it's not really a new product i mean yeah that, that's all sort of expected and yeah i mean you talked about it a bit in the review and i i think i agree that these products should just be 13th gen products that have in that product family or even better just don't bother just like don't release the products don't call it a mm-hmm. 14th gen just be like mm-hmm. look guys you know the next generation of cpus is not ready so we're just giving you a price cut this year. Like, let's make the 13900K cheaper and the 13700K cheaper, which is going to make them more competitive, uh, rather than just giving you, like, what are they, less than 5% faster most of the time, except for the, the 14700K mm. and, like, a few applications that use those e-cores. It's Yeah, it's small pointless. percentage overclocks, and that's if you can sustain those overclock or those clock frequencies, rather. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Obviously, that would be better... From a consumer standpoint, from our standpoint, that would be way better for Intel to do that. And as I said in the review, Intel didn't do that because they don't want to reduce margins for that silicon. They they want to maintain those margins but increase interest. Mm. And by pitching it, pitching the same thing to people as, hey, look, the new 14th gen's here, and it has some optimizations. And people are like, oh, cool. Well, I I'm interested in these new Intel CPUs. I don't know how many people fall for that. I don't know how effective that is in you know stirring up interest in the products, generating sales. I have no idea. Uh, Intel would know. They they do this stuff, so they they would know. But based on all the evidence we have, it doesn't appear to work. At least for the retail markets that you know we're involved in and and have yeah. contacts in. So retailers sales have been bad uh you know you can even check stuff like amazon you know best sale list which we could probably have a look at in a second uh but i imagine we won't find too many 14th gen cpus at the top of those lists really the only market where it might generate more sales is like you know laptops and you know pre-built systems that sort of stuff yeah but then laptops are moving to an actual 14th gen this year with the release of, I believe it's Media Lake, and I'm not 100%, I should probably have checked this beforehand, but I don't really cover laptops anymore. But yeah, Media Lake is, I believe, what they're, they're, which is a fully new architecture and things like that. So yeah, I guess the inability to get those chips working, I guess in a way for desktop that produces a performance uplift means that they're kind of stuck with this 13th gen thing again. So yeah, I mean, I... I don't think that their strategy of trying to keep margins and redrumming up interest is going to work at all. Like, I would have thought that more important than margins is just total desktop CPU revenue. Like, let's just sell more of these chips because people, like, the thirteenth gen sales are not amazing. Like, they're not. No, they're not good. They're not horrifically awful, but they're not. I'm sure that they're well below what Intel would ideally be liking to sell with these products. Mm -hmm. So I would have thought you drop the price. They don't have to drop the prices significantly. Just you announce a price drop and people are like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. These parts are cheaper. Now maybe I'll consider them because they're, you know, at a new price point. I'll reevaluate, you know, Intel versus AMD for those parts. And yeah, we'll see where it lands for my next, uh, you know, CPU platform upgrade. But releasing a product that is just boring, doesn't do anything, how is that ever going to drum up excitement? Like most people who are buying these retail desktop CPUs, things like K-series SKUs, are going to be watching reviews and looking at opinions online and doing all the research. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I saw anyone really taking the bait and sort of saying that this is a substantial improvement. It was all Mm -hmm. like, yeah, so this is the 13900K version 2. Mm -hmm. So... 
yeah, I just don't like it. Surely, if they had cut the price by, let's say, fifty to a hundred dollars for across the board, that they would actually get more total revenue from these parts. But maybe investors are more concerned about margins, which I don't know what investors are thinking because that's not <laughs> yeah, really my scene. I, I mean, like I said, there's a huge percentage of the market that we're ignorant of, like yeah. people who walk into a brick and mortar store and they're like, oh, you know, I'm after a new computer. What what's the new latest thing? And if the salesman, who probably in a lot of instances doesn't know any better, it's like, oh, Intel, they just released their new 14th generation, so that's a year ahead of AMD. You know, so we're recommending, you know, get this system. I, I, I don't know. Is that where they, they're getting sales? Yeah, Not sure. I, I guess part of it as well might be that, you know, if they are moving to an entirely new architecture with the 15th generation, they don't want to have this weird situation where they've got 13th gen and then they skip straight to 15th gen for the desktop or alternatively have 14th gen desktop 15th gen mobile i i guess but again that doesn't really justify it like you would just skip the generation like surely you would just be like yeah sorry guys didn't have anything which is which it, it happens right like i feel mm-hmm. like being honest with your customers and and fan base i guess is the better way of approaching these things, like just being like, like AMD doesn't release a CPU generation every year at the moment. They're mm-hmm. on a cadence that's longer than a year and they just go, okay, well, Zen 4 is ready now, so we're putting it out now. Uh, Zen 3 was ready when it was ready, so they put it out then. Whereas Intel seems very keen on having these new products out at a fairly regular cadence, which I guess just doesn't always work out and that's mm-hmm. fine. Just mm-hmm. be honest, I guess, with the products, but yeah, I don't know. Well, as a bit of a, a, a side note here, I did bring up the Amazon bestsellers list for Amazon.com, so the US-based mm-hmm. site for Amazon, and <laughs> this is quite comical. This wasn't the case when I checked randomly last week, but the number one best-selling CPU on Amazon right now, 9 o'clock tonight, uh, is the 7800X3D. So I wonder <laughs> if all the 14th gen reviews showing that CPU generally being the fastest gaming CPU across a reasonable range of games has helped elevate it to the number one spot uh, as on the Amazon best sales list. Not sure. The 13700K though, that is second. So they there is an Intel CPU in second mm-hmm. place. And then you got the 5600X, 5800X, so AM4 upgrades. And the 14900K does make an appearance in fifth spot. So... Okay. There is some evidence there to suggest that this refresh, because when I checked last time, there was no Core i9 in the top ten. So okay. they've got a they've got a six hundred dollar US CPU now in fifth position, admittedly, which I'm not sure how many of those fifth position CPUs for the a given hour they're selling, but it is a top ten. Uh, and then you've got fifty seven hundred G, fifty eight hundred X three D, fifty six hundred G. 5700X, 7600, 5600, and then the next Intel CPUs in 12th. So in the top, like, 15 spots, there's four or or five uh, Intel CPUs. So the the top 10 is dominated by AMD. There's two Intel CPUs in the top 10, um, being the 1400K in 5th and the 13700K in 2nd. And the Australian site is similar. Um, really though intel yeah. does sell better here in australia but there is no 14th gen cpus the top 14th gen cpu is the again the 14900k so that's interesting but that's in, it's in 21st position so uh, probably yeah, not, not selling too many of those down under yeah like it'd be very interesting obviously we will never get this answer but if mm-hmm. there was like a b testing of one group gets the 14900K, one group gets a cheaper 13900K. Like mm-hmm. where would the positioning be for those two parts? And I think if there was like, uh, I I don't think it would work if they just sort of quietly made the 13900K cheaper. I'm talking like yeah. a full marketing yep. push. Like these yep. are official price cuts. These are the new prices. We're asking reviewers to reevaluate them. Maybe people wouldn't bother doing that, but, you know, a, a real like- push. Yeah, if they did like some new motherboards, like the refresh boards, they could yep. send reviewers like one or two boards with the 1300K and, you know, hey, retest this. Here's some fast memory. Do an interesting yep. article about our official price cut. I think that would certainly, well, that would be better received, I think, from the reviewers and the viewers. And I think that has more chance of drumming up 
more interest in that product line and, and leading to more sales. But I mean, we're not the experts here. What the hell do we know? So I well, guess I, we leave that up to them. I feel like all companies these days, not just Intel, but AMD and NVIDIA as well, are very hesitant to do the official price cut. I feel mm. like five to 10 years ago, it was much more common to get these products getting official price cuts. I'm thinking of products like, wasn't it when the like a 1080 Ti launched, NVIDIA reduced the price of the GTX 1080. From memory, they dropped the price by $100 officially. Mm. I can probably check that briefly, but I believe that was the case, um, which again, like we don't really see that anymore. They would much rather re-release. And like if they were going to drop the, the 4080 in price to release a 4080 Ti in that spot, they would discontinue the 4080 and release a mm. new product that is slower at a lower price point. I think um, there's a lot more demand or th th there's certainly a bigger market to service now. So mm -hmm. you could be shooting yourself in the foot by officially discounting a product to move inventory and then something, there's a shift in the market and then that product just overnight becomes hugely in demand. So yeah. I think they yeah. prefer not to do, because once you've made an official price cut, that's it. You can't you can't really go, oh, actually, you know that official price cut? Well, we're going to officially... <laughs> uncut that and go yeah. back the other way because the price cuts are well received price hikes official price hikes not so much uh yep. so I, I think they just like to have the flexibility intel uh sorry well what we're seeing with intel as well but in particular amd they certainly like to shift prices around quite rapidly we see cpus that once were selling for near 500 dollars dropping down to 300 dollars or even lower and then depending yep. on supply and demand, they can fluctuate back up. And then before you know it, maybe they're back down again. So I think that's how they prefer to go about it. Um, yeah. Probably generating hype about official price cuts doesn't do too much for them. I think that is a really good strategy if you already have a winning or successful product and you want sure. to keep it responding to the market. Like something like the 7800X3D, if the, the new 14th gen was really compelling, then because it was already a well-received product, they could, for a brief period, start discounting that product around the launch unofficially, just mm -hmm. you know bump the prices down a little, so that in the reviews, the price of that product is a little bit cheaper. They can run that promotion for a couple of months around the launch. And then once all that hype dies down, they can push the price back up again. Not I'm saying this is a particularly good way of marketing products because mm -hmm. you don't want to just immediately respond briefly to a new CPU and then just ignore customers buying two months later. But mm. these are strategies that could work. I feel like if it's more of a negatively redu uh, received product, something like a 7900 XT, 7700 XT, all these new 14th gen CPUs just being a 13th gen with a price cut, that a price cut, you know, if people aren't interested in the product, then maybe a price cut is better. Whereas if it's, as you say, more popular, they want to respond more to the current market conditions, then yeah, keeping that flexibility is going to be pretty advantageous for them. Whereas, I mean, I just don't think that a 14th gen CPU is ever going to be exciting at these prices, similar to how I wouldn't think a 7900 XT would ever be $900 US again. Like it's just never going to sell well at that price. Yeah, that's right. I, I totally agree. Unfortunately, we don't, as you say, have all the facts and figures, so we don't really know from, mm -hmm. from an Intel perspective what play makes the most sense. But certainly for for the enthusiast crowd and, and the reviewers and stuff. Yeah, an official price cut would have been much better received than just, hey, here's the um, here's the new 14th gen that's the same thing. Yeah, so I saw some criticism. Well, I wouldn't say I saw heaps of criticism, oh, but there no. were a few comments oh, no. Where are surrounding we this? one of the main issues with the Intel CPUs this generation, okay. which is their power consumption. Their power yeah, consumption okay. being significantly higher than AMD's 7000 series, and I think in your uh, review, you put in some pretty significant work into mm -hmm. testing power consumption across a range of games and showing that and showing you know, that the performance is not only worse than something like a 7800X3D most of the time by a small amount, but the power consumption is significantly higher. So they're, mm -hmm. not, they're not giving you sort of more performance at a high level of power. They've kind of hit that double, double whammy this generation. But then I saw some comments complaining that you were focusing quite significantly on power consumption. Mm -hmm. So what's well, going on here, Steve? Are well, you biased? I, I, yeah. Um, shout out to Andy at eTechnics because I was talking with him and he said they're heavily looking at power consumption on these for gaming and stuff. He, he said to me, what would you do 
would you measure power consumption of every single game you test? And I was just at the start of my testing and I thought, hey, that's a good idea. That's what I would do. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I should do. Because normally I do all the benchmarking, put so much focus and effort into testing all the CPUs, updating the games list, doing all that. We get to the end, we're like, oh, uh, power consumption. And usually we like run Blender or Cinebench or something and measure power mm-hmm. that way, which is, you know, it's it's full maximum CPU utilization, maximum power draw. So in a way that's useful. But for those who, which is the bulk of our audience, really only care about the gaming benchmarks and come to look at those, there's no real relevant power data for that. Recently, we've started looking at power consumption in games, but it's like, you know, one, two, three, because when you go back and do that testing, you're, you're essentially doing the exact same testing you'd already done. But instead of just focusing on average frame rates, 1% lows, you're now taking total system power usage. So uh, the, the and the average across that benchmark run. So I thought I'd just gather that data simultaneously. That's much more efficient, makes a lot more sense. Probably should have been doing that sooner. But yeah, when, when Andy made that comment to me, I was like, mm, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I did it. Uh, and yeah, the, the focus on power consumption for CPUs more so than, I suppose, GPUs is that, yeah, NVIDIA GPUs are generally more power efficient, which you know <laughs> we note every single time we look at them, but the difference isn't like double or more. So mm-hmm. generally speaking, they're ballpark. Uh, it, it's not nearly as absurd as what we're seeing with, you know, Raptor Lake, Raptor Lake refresh versus Zen 4. So, and people are interested. People have asked a lot for CPU power consumption while gaming um, and generally total system because I feel like that's a more useful metric than just looking at the CPUs. Uh, but we can talk about them more if you want. Uh, so, yeah, that's why I did it. I, I, I really found the data interesting. Yeah, I mean, I... Again, I think these some of these comments around these reviews that we see are kind of a bit silly, but I do like bringing mm-hmm. them up because I find them silly and kind of a bit funny. Um, but I think maybe it's just a misread from commenters on how reviews work again. Mm-hmm. You know, there's only so much time that you can spend talking about products in a review. Like we don't want to make these reviews like 50 minutes, an hour long, going into in-depth on every single possible thing about reviews. So when things are more or less relevant, that's going to depend on you know, that's going to allocate the time that you'd spend in the review to talking about those things. Mm-hmm. If power consumption was not relevant, then you would spend basically no time on it. You would just very quickly be like, okay, power consumption is very similar between these two generations. So yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whereas if it's a really significant discrepancy, then you want to spend more time on that because it becomes more and more relevant, the bigger the difference is. I yep. think a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, I should be very specific here, a very small minority of people <laughs> get caught up in the whole fairness of like you which, need to allocate the same amount of time in every review to the same things, which is makes the reviews worse and boring. Like you're going to yeah, need to yeah, you want to look at the relevant them. stuff, as you say. And yeah, I, I, I saw one comment about that saying that you know we're doing this for Intel AMD CPUs, but we're not doing it for Nvidia slash Radeon GPUs, and it's like no, that's a lie. Your 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 own bias is clouding your judgment on that because. We have absolutely slammed a lot of the RDNA 3 GPUs and said the GeForce alternatives are better for a whole host of reasons. Uh, A lot of people wanted us to look at the 6950 XT when that was selling at a heavily discounted price, I think around $600 US. It was cheaper than an RTX 4070. People were saying we should recommend that GPU. I compared them. The power usage on the Radeon GPU was way higher. And I noted many times that the main reason I would get the GeForce GPU, the RTX 4070, is because it's a much more efficient product and uses less power. That was one of the key advantages of it. Mm-hmm. So we definitely aren't doing what we're accused of. But anyway. I guess it's probably not healthy to get caught up in or in significant negative comments but i do just find it funny the whole discussion about the, these things yeah, and this, yeah. and oh, criticisms it, it, of like why are you specifically looking at this in this review when you didn't yeah, look yeah. at that in a different well, review it's like well because it may it's ugh. more relevant this time around like that's, that's i mean they're, 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 they're confirming their own biases i loved i saw quite a few of these it really really surprised me a lot of people were accusing us of using total system power usage because it inflates the number because it includes the RTX mm. 4090. And that's really unfair on Intel. We should, if we were, if we were honest and we wanted to be accurate, we'd look at just CPU usage, which is funny for 
at least three reasons that I can think of straight away. One of them being that if we look at just CPU usage, it's way worse for Intel. They go from using like 40 to 50% more power to like 90 to tech testers saw like nearly uh, or around 150% or something in, in certain, I think it might've been Cyberpunk, uh, comparing yeah. the, I think it might've been the 7800X 3D to the 4900K. But obviously if you isolate just the component that's using all the power, that inflates the number, doesn't make it smaller. So that yeah. that's a weird one. I mean, they're, they're silly comments. I, I feel like a lot of the time we get those sorts of comments. It, it just shows, I guess it's kind of like a hot take, right? Like people want to slam out their sort of poorly thought out opinion very quickly mm-hmm. without sort of really thinking about what the consequences of showing information like that would be. Mm-hmm. I feel like we spend a lot of time thinking about how to present data and things like that and what are sort of the consequences of changing things. And people always just think, oh, okay, well, I, I, you're including the 4090s. That makes the overall number bigger, which must mean that Intel looks worse as a result. But then they don't think about how, as you say, you take that out and then the margins, like the bar graphs would suddenly look all, you know, you're basically just cutting off all that GPU data yeah. and now it's all stretched and, out. And you know, they make the really argument that. that the 4090 works harder when it's producing higher frame rates. We're like, yeah, yeah, we know. We, that's why we show the... That's why we show the performance first, and then directly after that, we show the total system usage. And in like 80% of the cases, what you're claiming is unfair in Intel was actually unfair in AMD, because AMD, the 7800X 3D, for example, was generally driving higher frame rates, and therefore that would result in the RTX 4090 using more power. So yeah. obviously, like, you know, performance per watt and stuff can solve that, but I like to just, it's really easy to understand here's how much power the whole system used in this test. And you just saw the resulting frame rate. And it wasn't like the the frame rates were generally pretty close. Like on average, I think the 700X 3D was like 9% faster than the 1300K and I don't know, maybe 7% faster or something like that than the 1400K. So that's that's pretty close overall. But then power consumption was, I don't don't know what the average was, but it was like 40% more. So Pretty big discrepancy there. Pretty clear that the Intel CPU uses way more power. Yeah, I mean, I don't, again, I don't want to get caught up in negative comments too much because, like I said, I think <laughs> is it, we're talking but, but about four more. <laughs> well, we're, we're talking about four, like four or five commenters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a handful of Reddit well, commenters. Yeah, if you're on on, yeah. on YouTube, like it's yeah. not. We're just kind of making fun of people making silly comments, which is sort of something that we do on Twitter a lot, and it's kind people of amusing. Love that. Well, but these days we have, it's almost like an army of people in our Discord community pointing out people's oh, silly comments that we Yeah, they in, which, love it. They oh, love it. It's funny. crazy. Um, yeah, it keeps them busy, but hey, if they're having fun and I guess they're supporting us directly, so if they're enjoying themselves, that's great. But yeah, Reddit, um, man, that, that provides endless entertainment on our Discord. Uh, there's some it. funny stuff on there. So. And people say to us, you know, why do you read the Reddit comments? Why do you know what's going on? It's like, we don't. <laughs> we get it served up to us by countless people. Yeah. Uh, it's but, like they never serve. Why don't they ever serve us the nice positive comments where nah, they're saying nah, how good we are? It's like, we nah, don't need nah. that. It's, well, it's first of all, there's probably none of them. But <laughs> second of all, this is not fun. That's well, not fun, to our, Jim. According to our Discord, there are no positive comments, I guess. Nah, um, nah. The other issue with Intel's 14th gen CPUs at the moment and probably something they're really going to have to solve with the next generation is the dead-end platform and the lack of platform support. I Mm. feel like people are really not going to be that interested in doing a full system upgrade to a 14th gen platform, firstly because it's not that much faster than 13th gen, so Mm -hmm. you might just buy that. But, you know, you're not really getting promised longevity with these platforms. And I think even though this current platform has supported technically three upgrades you have been able to go from 12th to 14th gen <laughs> across three years people okay. really want people really want three legitimate cpu generations uh with their yeah. platform because gen- not all the time but certainly recently amd for example has been able to deliver in excess of 50 percent performance uplifts across three generations and it can be an even larger margin depending on the product that you're looking at Mm -hmm. Uh, whether you're, for example, doing like a Ryzen 5 to Ryzen 7 upgrade across three generations, you can tend to get a pretty large performance increase. So I feel like that's a really key benefit. And we've seen that across AM4, obviously, throughout the last 
six years or so now that that sells platforms, sells CPUs. Mm -hmm. I think that, I don't know whether Intel has plans to offer that from 15th gen onwards, but they need to come out and, well, first of all, they need to do it and they need to come out and make a firm promise saying, we're not going to keep this in the dark anymore. We're not going to just rely on people reading rumors, but you know, we are going to support this until a certain date. We're going to support a certain number of generations on this platform and give people the chance to invest in an Intel platform, which could theoretically start with the 15th gen upgrade. You upgrade to 15th gen, they're saying, okay, well, you can, you know, in three years, we're going to have a much faster CPU. You can drop that in. All, all good. I feel like even if they get good performance out of those CPUs that are coming up next, that that is potentially going to limit them as it has across the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. That, that That's true. I do wonder how successful AM5 is going to be. Are we going to see a repeat of AM4? I'm not confident. Hmm. I think Why'd you say that? Because AMD hasn't, maybe they learned their lesson from last time. I mean, let's be honest, they tried to bail on AM4, like not, not on the they socket, did. but on the, so yeah. that that's one reason why I'm not super confident. I, I don't know. I guess it's it's just yeah they've got, they've got to prove it, which makes it tough. And that's why I said in my video there is the future platform spot. We're def- the the plat- AM5 definitely has a future. It's just we don't know how good that future is yet. So while it is a factor, I I'm hesitant to tell people you know go all in on that because you're about to get you know some CPU down the track that'll be miles faster than what you're currently buying. I, I, not sure, but if they do support like let's say three generations and you know the third one offers a substantial uplift over the initial release mm-hmm. then i think that would be enough for am5 to be quite successful uh, probably not to the same degree am4 was but much more successful than intel's platforms let's say because yeah well you got 12th which you know was good upgrade and then you got 13th which was like uh, Okay, yeah, all right. And then you got 14th, which was a complete waste of time. You know, if you had a bought like a 12, 700K, are you going to go to a, you know, a 1300K or 1400K? No. So there's really no upgrade there. But, you know, we saw with AM4, if you had a bought like even a 13600K or a, or a, a you know, 3700X, something like that, a few years later, you get a discounted 5800X 3D. And that's, huge like 50 percent performance uplift in games i'd think on average i'm not don't don't quote yeah. me on that but the, we have the data it's a substantial performance upgrade for very very little investment and that's the problem with intel again as well because getting affordable core i9 processors good luck with that i don't know what the 1200k is selling for these days but it's probably gotten better than it used to be um i'm not sure if it's in the list that i brought up but uh, they're generally still pretty expensive. A couple of things I think hinge on the success of AM5, and it's probably, I would agree with you, that's probably not going to be as successful as AM4. One of them is that back when the first generation Ryzen parts launched, there were obviously a lot of areas to improvement for those processes. And one of them was the introduction of Vcash. So, you know, they didn't introduce that until the fourth generation of processes on that line with the mm-hmm. Uh, Zen 3 line, whereas with Zen uh, AM5 and Zen 4, the very first generation has had Vcash parts available. So if you did go with a 7800X3D as your very first purchase, then there's not that easy, let's just give you more cash solution for down the line with, say, a Zen 6, for example. Sure. And on top of that, I think they haven't... One of the real big wins for AM4 was the amount of people buying it as a budget system, people getting a 100 to $150 sort of mm-hmm. Zen 2 or Zen Plus CPU and tracking that on a really cheap motherboard, which set them up for, again, like a 5800X 3D later down the line, was with AM5 right now. We still don't really have that super compelling, super cheap product and motherboards are still somewhat too expensive. So maybe there's not going to be as much of that mass of people coming in and, and purchasing, you know, sort of these budget systems, which then give them those, like, again, like if you've bought a cheap Ryzen 5 and then later you're upgrading to the Ryzen 7 X3D part, that's more scope for upgrades. But if everyone on AM5 is just buying the 7800 X3D, then it's going to be a very different story. But then again, you know, there's other, there's other things that even an Intel could do, such as, 
launching new CPUs at a much lower price. So if they come out and they launch, you know, a 15900K that offers a certain level of performance, and then in three generations, that is a Core i5 level part, then the people that originally invested in a Core i5 and then are upgrading to a CPU three gens later at a similar sort of price, hopefully would be getting a significant performance improvement. Mm. So, you know, there's all those sorts of avenues that that could make future platform support a success. It's just a matter of Intel doing it. But again, I think it comes down to them. They at least have to tell people that that's what they're doing as opposed to not really doing anything. Like even if they don't execute super well, like they don't give you a 50% upgrade, not telling or at least not advising people of future platform support is going to hurt their Mm -hmm. brand perception, I guess, and the, the level of sales of people wanting to invest versus AMD, who, again, I think they've only mentioned platform support is it to 2025 i believe so yeah so again it's not not a crazy so, amount of support there but yeah that's right you get three cpus probably uh yeah how much performance you get hard to say i mean we'll have to see what zen 5 offers i mean that's another concern for intel as well i mean yeah speculation based entirely off rumors but it sounds like the next step with the new platform is not going to be huge over what we currently have rumors speculation not sure on that one but they'd want to make for a new platform they'd realistically want to make a pretty decent step forward to justify the new platform for one next topic that i probably wanted to get to this is again we sort of talked about one company making a blunder let's talk about amd making a blunder with anti-lag plus because this is just (laughs) this is amd with a i don't know like an unforced error like uh, I kind of understand companies making forced errors, like not having a, mm-hmm. a product that's fast enough so they can't compete. So that's fair enough. You just, your product isn't as good. Mm-hmm. This anti lag plus situation is, was extremely avoidable. 100% could not have blown up at all. Unforced errors. So let me explain briefly what happened. First up, Counter Strike 2, the Twitter page for that, came out with this update that reads, AMD's latest driver has made their anti-lag plus feature available for CS2, which is implemented by detouring engine DLL functions. If you're an AMD customer and play CS2, do not enable anti-lag plus in all caps. Any tampering with CS code will result in a VAC ban, which I believe is Valve anti-cheat or something Mm -hmm. along those lines, but it refers to their anti-cheat solution. Obviously, being a multiplayer game, cheating is very important. Uh, one, once AMD ships an update, we can do the work of identifying affected users and reversing their ban. Basically, this sort of boiled over into the discovery that potentially Anti-Lag Plus has been causing issues with bans in other multiplayer titles. I don't Apex Legends, for example. Yeah, I think that was one of the examples there. And that led to a driver update a couple of days ago, removing Anti-Lag Plus technology entirely. So... Mm-hmm. Basically, AMD says they've received reports of some games triggering anti-cheat bans on games when AMD Anti-Lag Plus technology is enabled. To address this, we have released this new driver, 23.10.2, that disables Anti-Lag Plus technology in all supported games, and they recommend gamers use the new driver. I believe they pulled the previous driver that has Anti-Lag Plus support for CS2, so you can't even download that anymore, and they're working with game developers on a solution to re-enable Anti-Lag Plus and supporting them in reinstating any banned gamers. Mm. So, yeah, this is just a fail. Like, this is just straight uh, yeah. up is a fail. I mean, getting banned, that's that's not very anti-lag. <laughs> it's, it's very lag. It's yeah. very lag-inducing. Uh, how did they test it is probably my know. first question. Sure, because they CSGO would, be, would have been right onto that. Probably Apex Legends as well, like yeah how many times you have to play before it detects that there's been files altered i I would have thought it'd be pretty onto that like the the concept of anti-lag plus sounds good right Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. nvidia reflexes had to be integrated into games so having a driver side solution where all amd has to do is release a new driver profile for a game to do their you know lag Mm -hmm. reducing technology sounds really good but I guess the the fundamental disconnect there is that it's well known for multiplayer gaming that things like overlays and performance monitoring software that injects various different things and tries to you know determine in-game stats and things like that very often can trigger 
anti-cheat mm-hmm. detection software. So the last thing you want to be doing is running all this injection technology to do things like anti-lag. So again, I was sort of very surprised that this was, I sort of had an inkling that this was the way it worked, but I hadn't really looked into anti-lag plus too much. It was actually one of my mm-hmm. upcoming videos that I was planning on doing, but I guess that's not happening. So, <laughs> but might yeah, eventually. It's just, it's just it, it, bizarre that, that it's like a known thing in the multiplayer community and then they've gone right. and implemented yeah. using that? Yeah, that's right. It's it's truly bizarre for, for two reasons. Firstly, how did they not know, you know that was going to be the end result before they did it? Because that should be obvious, right? Yeah. And then secondly, how did they test it? <laughs> like that's, I don't, how they, do these things get out in the wild? It also seems pretty clear that they have not reached out to game developers in an Mm -hmm. appropriate manner developing this technology Mm -hmm. because if they had reached out to Valve or um, whoever makes Apex Legends, I forget right now, um, if they'd reached out to those game studios and they're like, this is our anti-lag plus technology and this is how it works, a developer straight away would have been like, yeah, that'll trigger anti-cheat. Don't do that. So I, I guess they haven't really gone through and I, I, it just seems like a bit of a fail on there. Uh, obviously, it's a fail for gamers because mm-hmm. they're getting banned <laughs> and it's not a good yep. look for the company and it's caused blowback. And again, there's sort of this resurfacing of AMD's drivers suck and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But also, it's a fail from their developer relations. Like they n- want to make sure that they are, you know, keeping up good relationships with game developers so that when they do have a technology like FSR3, for example, then the relationship with them is good enough that they can convince them to integrate those technologies and support their GPU products. And if they're going around, you know, like a cowboy integrating these technologies that don't, you know, mess with the game and a driver side and they're not talking to the game devs doing it and they're like, we're fixing your game by reducing lag, but we're not telling you and we're putting in the driver. I can't imagine game developers are too happy and, you know, in this Counter-Strike 2 post, they're saying, you know, they're going to have to work with AMD to identify users and reverse bans. That's their resources as a development studio that has to now be put into identifying users banned because of this feature. I just, like, I shake my head at this. It's so stupid. What are they, like, I, it, this was totally avoidable. And that that's the sort of thing that has really irritated me with some of the way that Radeon GPUs and their software features have sort of, Mm -hmm. approach these things as time goes on we've just seen the fsr3 launch that again i think had very avoidable problems um, with it that could have been managed a lot better from the initial release that would have avoided unforced errors they could have launched in a better state it gets more positive reviews people talk about it in a more positive light and then they have this anti-lag plus thing happening again sort of yeah Mm. very disappointing and i'd if i was a, a radion owner i'd be yeah pretty disappointed that they've just they've had to remove this technology from their games and yeah i think pretty clearly the way that nvidia has been doing it with reflex makes a lot more sense integrating it into the games themselves especially for a multiplayer title if it does require dll injection (laughs) the other way around then yeah that obviously Mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense so yeah well gamers are sensitive when it comes to their gaming and i think the quickest way to drive away customers would be to get them banned from their favorite games (laughs) so a bit of a whoopsie there Yes, yeah, a bit of a fail. I was also disappointed with anti lag Plus was that it didn't work with FSR3 properly either. So I don't know, like... Why would those two things be compatible, Tim? Well, they should be. Reflex <laughs> is compatible with uh, DLSS that was, that frame was, That was sarcasm. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, like, it seems very rushed. Like, mm-hmm. I... Mm-hmm. I don't know how stretched thin their their software development team is at the moment, but there's obviously a number of different fronts that AMD is trying to compete on with software. Mm-hmm. You know, they're having to improve FSR two, FSR three is now a thing. They've had DLSS three point five, which I'm assuming someone has probably been deployed to make a, a version of. They've had to combat Reflex. You know, Nvidia's been pumping in things like their um, Raider instruction. Yeah, noise like noise cancellation, video mm-hmm. encoding, uh, the you know video super resolution, all these sorts of features. And you know the AMD software team is probably not as large as Nvidia, and you know if they've only got a couple of people working on these sorts of technologies, and yeah, they're kind of mm-hmm. under the pump with some of these things. And I just wish that with these features that AMD would release them when they are ready. Like the mm-hmm. the damage that can be done by releasing a feature that's not ready and has issues. Even if it's late, like it, it's better to be late and working correctly 
than releasing early and being broken and bad and getting negative feedback and causing damage. I think we've seen that with game. Like how many times have we seen that with games? Like Cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> releases broken and everyone's like, yeah, that don't do that again. And I think they probably learnt their lesson there. Yeah, I want to say every time, but no, it does happen a lot. It does happen a surprising amount. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I hold hope for the anti-lag plus technology. I think it, at least what I'd seen briefly testing it before it was removed in the non-FSR3 configurations, it seemed to be as effective as Reflex just briefly for a single-player title. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they can come back with some sort of solution that works. Potentially they have to make it sort of a, a... feature that can be integrated into games or something along those lines or have it the driver feature for single player games integrate into games for multiplayer i'm not sure what the solution is there but yeah i I don't think that they can keep this injection way working because as soon as you allow uh, like if if valve whitelists anti-lag plus as a thing that can inject things into their game then that immediately opens up a vector for cheaters to sort of try and exploit They'll try and hook into anti lag plus as a way in. And mm-hmm. that's probably not something that is going to be suitable. So we'll see where that goes. But yeah, wasn't too impressed there. Another thing that was weird this week, another AMD thing, is that they launched two new GRE GPUs. So you tested earlier this year, what was it? The 7900 uh, GRE. Yeah, so a weird launch there, the Golden Rabbit Edition, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was sort of this China-only slash OEM system integrator-only GPU, and they've done that again right now with RDNA 2 products. Actually a worse launch in a number of ways. So first of all, there are two Radeon RX 6750 GRE products, the 10 gigabyte and 12 gigabyte models, which do differ than more than just VRAM. The 10 gigabyte model has 36 compute units, the 12 gigabyte model has 40 compute units. The 12 gigabyte model is also clocked slightly higher. And because it has 12 gigabytes of memory, it uses a 192 bit memory bus instead of 160 bit. So it has more infinity cache as well. So memory bandwidth is also higher for the 12 gig model. Um, the 12 gig model is priced at, well, it has an MSRP of $290. So not 100% sure how relevant that is if you can't buy it, but it's supposed to be priced at $290. The 6750 GRE is $270. So, yeah, not great naming there. They've kind of pulled in NVIDIA with the product naming. Again, it's sort of an exclusive China thing, so it won't have too much impact on the market, I wouldn't have thought. But the weird thing to me with this launch, and this is the main thing that I want to talk about, $270. Now, they launched a product earlier this year, the RX 7600, at $270, -hmm. which... Given that this RX 6750 is probably around the performance of an RX 6700, 6700 XT type GPU, and it has more VRAM, why didn't they just why didn't they just launch this? Because they could only they could only sell that card for two seventy. That's as low as I could go, Tim. Didn't you know? <laughs> it's so bizarre that they've launched two GPUs in the one year at the same price. What's going on there? With this this card seems so much more compelling to me in the two hundred and seventy dollars price range. Maybe mm-hmm. they don't have enough stock, but I would much rather be buying a ten gigabyte GPU with these specs for two hundred and seventy dollars than the seventy six hundred. Would you yeah. agree? Uh, I I'd say so. I haven't tested it, but yeah, I, course, I, yeah. I, I, I would imagine so. Yeah, they they don't want to rebrand this GPU into the 7000 series, which would make it sort of that new and exciting product, even if it's basically just a copy of what they did previously. Mm-hmm. So they've gone with this GR, like maybe they've got too many of these GPUs still. Like even today, it's quite easy to buy 6700 XTs. They must, like yeah. That. So we, we heard there was a lot of 6700 XTs, but <laughs> clearly a lot, because as far as I can tell, they've been selling pretty well. So they must have just overall like crazy just yeah flogging these out during that the mining boom and mm-hmm. yeah they're sort of and stuck that, with them now yeah well, they thought they'd be doing it for at least another year i, I would have thought yes possibly yeah it's maybe ended a bit too soon for them but yeah mm-hmm. at 270 dollars, this is the car that should have launched but yeah they weren't gonna pull an intel i guess and rebrand a 6750 gre into the rx I don't know, 7600 XT or something like that. They were pretty keen, I guess, on making sure the 7000 series were all RDNA 3 products. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
yeah, it'd be nice to get this product outside of China. It doesn't look too bad, but yeah, again, I might try and get one. We'll see. We'll see what it takes. Yeah, if it's like again, like even the RX sixty seven hundred was more of a limited launch, wasn't it? Like, were you? Ever able to get one in Australia or did they launch uh, here? They did sell here for a little while, yeah, but there wasn't – well, we just we just didn't bother with it at the time because we had RDNA 3 coming up and all that sort of stuff. So we sort of changed what we were focusing on. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've just had a look more closely at the specifications. So, yeah, the 10 gigabyte model is pretty much just an RX 6700. The 12 gigabyte model of the 6750 GRE is basically a 6700 XT. So the naming is a bit weird. Mm-hmm. There is obviously mm-hmm. a 6750 XT. This is sort of slotting below the 6700 XT, so I don't really know what's going on there. But anyway, a bit of an interesting launch there that, yeah, I guess doesn't have too much impact because you can't actually buy it. And the final thing that I want to talk about in this, I guess what you say, news recap, not 100% sure what this episode is, just talking about random things, is AMD's new Threadripper 7000 series CPUs, which at the time of us recording this is, I think it's still under NDA for just a little bit, but by the time you're listening to this, obviously we will be allowed to talk about it. Ryzen Threadripper 7000, they've actually done something a little bit unexpected, maybe for me, in this series, which is that there are two Ryzen Threadripper 7000 series lines. So there Mm -hmm. is the Threadripper Pro series and the just regular Threadripper non-pro series. So I believe with the previous 5,000 series parts, they only released Pro Series Threadripper, did they? With the like this 5995WX or whatever it's called? Uh, Jeez, that's bad. I can't remember. Yes, I believe believe it's Pro. Pro. Okay. Yeah, I believe so. And it was the generation prior to that where they had the two. Yeah, the two, the 3970X and then the Pro 3970X. So. They've gone back to having this split between the pro and non-pro lines. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this is that it does actually produce specification differences between the the models and their capabilities. So when you buy a Ryzen Pro series CPU, I believe that gives you some additional benefits over the uh, HEDT line, specifically the ability to use them on the WRX90 platform. So with this new series, there's a split in platforms. We've got the TRX50, which is the HEDT platform, which supports the regular Ryzen Threadripper non-pro CPUs. This platform is obviously going to be the cheaper platform. It has uh, quad-channel memory, so four-channel memory. It has up to 88 usable PCIe lanes, of which I believe 48 of those are PCI 5.0. So the rest okay. will be a lower PCI specification. Mm-hmm. And overclocking will be enabled, but you don't get, you know, the pr- obviously pro features. Once you upgrade to the WRX90 platform, which is the pro platform, this increases the memory channel configurations up to eight channels, so a doubling of memory mm-hmm. channels. You get the full PCIe lane support, so up to uh, 144 piece usable PCIe lanes, of which 128 of them are PCI 5.0. So again, pretty substantial increase in PCIe there. And again, overclocking is still enabled. So if you buy a Pro CPU, you can use them on either the WRX90 or TRX50 platforms. If you buy just the regular Threadripper, you're kind of locked into that Mm four-channel lower PCIe lane solution. So this is how they're sort of managing the, I guess, what would end up being a price difference between the Pro and non-Pro CPUs. So you're still getting, obviously, the higher core count options with the normal Threadripper line. So they're releasing a 7980X, which is a 64-core CPU with up to a 5.1 gigahertz maximum uh, turbo clock. The 7970X is a 32-core model, 5.3 gigahertz max boost. And the 7960X, which is a 24-core model with 5.3 gigahertz, uh, that forms the majority of the Threadripper the sort of yeah, standard Threadripper line. These are very expensive CPUs starting at $1,500 for 24 cores, $2,500 US for 32 cores, and $5,000 US if you want 64 cores. So mm-hmm. uh, certainly pretty expensive there. And that forms, yeah, the basis of the Threadripper line. Obviously, you do get the extra core count, as I said, but the additional you know memory channels, additional PCIe lanes over the you know just regular Zen 4 platform. I should probably mention these are Zen 4 CPUs. It's probably pretty important, <laughs> pretty important factor there. 
And when you go up to the pro line, they do have a couple of additional, I believe it's one additional option, which is the 96 core model, uh, which is sort of like the fully unlocked Epic design with all the triplets enabled. Again, 5.1 gigahertz, uh, yeah, maximum turbo clock. These are all 350 watt parts as well. So it is a TDP increase over the previous generation. AMD are claiming a, a range of different, you know, performance increases. You know, you can sort of look at those numbers if you want to later. But yeah, they're sort of claiming obviously, you know, 20, 30 percent more performance for some uh, workstation tasks over the 5000 series and a variety of performance gains as well, like 20, 30, 40 percent, depending on the workload over Intel's competing products as well, which have, yeah, a much sort of more different range of price uh configurations and core count mm -hmm. configurations these will be available on november 21st as well so they're launching them now in october coming a month later they're sort of preparing for the whole oh yeah. they're announcing them and then launching them yeah so they're announcing them now launching mm -hmm. them later mm -hmm. um they have ddr5 5200 support and things like that so yeah pro pretty substantial uplift over the threadripper 5000 series with their yeah increasing core count ddr5 memory pci 5.0 more cache obviously the IPC increase of, of Zen 4, and yeah, the, the return of the Threadripper standard series. It's probably a pretty niche thing because we're talking about CPUs that start at $1,500 US, mm. which is mm. way more expensive than a 7950X, but mm -hmm. uh, and it actually scales not super well via core count there either because what's a 7950X these days? $700, $600, something uh, like that? Probably closer to $600. Um yeah, yeah. So you're getting well. 16. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm thinking of the X3D. Yeah, the the X is probably closer to five. So the X3D is at 650. Okay. Uh, yeah, like 540. You're looking at for the non 3DV cash part. Yeah, pretty so, pretty cheap. It's like three times more expensive. Yeah, three times more expensive to get you know an increase from 16 to 24 cores, and then, I mean, you're basically really going to need the you know additional memory channels the additional pci lanes to justify that sort mm -hmm. of improvement mm -hmm. because yeah they're just not like back in the old days of threadripper when the desktop line was only capping out at eight cores threadripper made a lot more sense because you could get a significant increase in core count as well as all those you know performance advantages and that made a big difference for a lot of workstation applications whereas these days you really need these workstation apps that scale very well across a large variety, a large number of cores. Mm -hmm. Things like Premiere for us as content creators and Photoshop and those things. Well, Photoshop is pretty highly single threaded, but Premiere, you know, I don't imagine that will scale super well to a 96 core CPU, but it works pretty well in a 16 core CPU. So, mm -hmm. yeah, these are very much niche workload type of products and a lot of the advertising that they're doing in terms of performance numbers and things like that are for people that are you know compiling unreal engine using mm -hmm. it for 3d rendering manufacturing design you know solid works those sorts of apps autocad mm -hmm. so that's basically why it's expensive because you either need it yeah. or you don't you've got yeah. pretty good 16 core cpus on the mainstream platform and but yeah we're talking about the cpu being three times more expensive i mean wait until you see the motherboard prices even the trx 50 boards like you think am5 is expensive you ain't seen nothing yet so yeah what would you guess a thousand dollars starting price for one of those motherboards thereabouts i i would expect uh it got to be at least 700 dollars plus uh, i'd have to imagine i hope yeah. the platform is better supported amd kind of killed the last two generations of threadripper and they were very poorly supported very disappointing so I would be quite tentative going into this. Um, yeah, I'd like to see the range of motherboards that are on offer, uh, how well supported the boards will be. Uh, and I, I, I'm a bit in the dark. I haven't admittedly read all the information yet that, that has been provided to us. I've, I've been a little busy. I'll probably get that uh, yeah. get to that tomorrow morning. Not too much on platform. Not too much on platform. It's been mm -hmm. the majority of the presentation that they AMD provided is on just the performance of these CPUs and very much a focus on the pro lines. So the vast yeah. majority of these slides are designed, you know, very much talking about, you know, they've even got this slide here about the applications that they're certified and optimized for Threadripper processes. Not very much talk on the, the platform outside of the things that AMD are specifically supporting, like eight versus four channels and things like that. So yeah, I mean, I think wasn't the issue with one of the previous Threadripper lines that AMD announced 
platform longevity for like they're mm. saying you can upgrade to a future gen and that never happened they just yeah, straight that, up replaced it yeah that might have been the 3000 series i'll have to go back and do a bit of research on that if uh well i believe we will be reviewing some of these cpus so i'll do the appropriate level of research to find out exactly what happened there but yeah basically it, it, in any case it was disappointing because you know we got pretty invested in the the 5000 yeah. series here and just the yeah the board support the board updates it wasn't great the amount of boards available not good uh I'd, I'd be pretty disappointed if i had to spend i think i think the 64 core cpu was like eleven thousand australian dollars i'd be pretty upset if i invested eleven thousand dollars in that cpu and then you know had uh, we tested i think four of the the boards supporting that cpu and all of them had you know varying problems so pretty annoying yeah, I think that is a sort of disappointing aspect to our experience with Threadripper over the the last couple of generations. It, it felt, mm -hmm. again, it sort of has felt like Threadripper, and I, I can understand this perspective, it has gone from being that sort of enthusiast option for high-end buyers of all types that are interested mm -hmm. in additional CPU cores for a wide variety of workloads, you would go with Threadripper. They were more affordable. There was a, a wider range of boards. There was theoretical platform support, at least that was advertised. And yeah, a lot of different creators and people that were interested in a high-performance CPU would go with Threadripper. People were doing things like you know, gaming on Threadripper while also using it for editing videos and things like that because it was the highest performing, you know, not super ridiculous editing solution at the time. Good for sort of all sorts of use cases. And over the years as the mainstream platform has become more capable with more CPU mm -hmm. cores and features and things like PCI 5.0, which really aren't utilized to, you know, too much of a degree for mm -hmm. you know, people that need to do video editing, for example, um, it's sort of become more and more niche. And I think that's given AMD maybe some outs and excuses, not, not for things like motherboard quality. The motherboards shouldn't have issues when you're spending this much money, but mm -hmm. it certainly gives them an out for things like platform longevity, because they're basically conceding here that if you can afford a $5,000 CPU and a $1,000 motherboard, it's and it's crucial for your work and you're buying it to make money at your job, that you're probably just going to be able to afford a complete platform redo the next generation. Like if you've spent $6,000 minimum on just the CPU and motherboard, mm -hmm. then you can probably spend $6,000 next time to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. Which again, like... If you don't make the promise, if that's what where you're going to go, like don't say we're going to support future CPUs and this is a great platform to invest in to then can it, just admit and concede and just be like, yeah, this is designed for workstation pros. The best experience is if we redo the platform every single time. That's where we're taking this. You know, mm -hmm. we know you workstation users are going to buy it. So that that's our offering at the moment. We want to give the best solution. But yeah, I think the the motherboard support and things like that needs to be top notch because mm -hmm. yeah even today like i'm using currently my editing rig is a 3970x so that is mm -hmm. the 32 core from the 3000 series so it's a zen 2 cpu i believe zen 3 had a six up to 64 cores didn't it which is what you were using for some of yes. yours Yep. some of your generation so yeah yeah i mean it's been good but over time there has been issues with things like compatibility i've had some issues with like usb on my motherboard and things like that which have improved through bios updates over the years but still i have some issues where things just don't work super well i've had to reinst like reinstalling windows has fixed things a few times but again you ideally don't want to be reinstalling windows all that often on a workstation platform where you've mm -hmm. got all your apps set up you really want to do that once per pc that you're building mm -hmm. Just some weird, you know, just some things that I haven't been able to solve with my personal rig that I haven't really encountered on mainstream platforms with very similar parts. So things like, yeah, the RTX 3090 that I'm currently using just doesn't work as well on my Threadripper platform than on other platforms. And I'm not talking about performance because obviously it's going to be, you know, more bottlenecked for some scenarios because the CPU power isn't there. But just things like, even things like at the moment, my current Threadripper system will not boot at all ever with three displays hooked up and really ne wow. never will not ref it just crashes when, once it gets to that point where it shows the spinning loading thing that goes mm -hmm. around it just crashes 
just will will not wow. progress free, freezes. I put the thirty nine that exact same thirty ninety in any other system works perfectly every single time with three four K displays hooked up. It's only my Threadripper system. It's reared its head again because, as I mentioned in the previous podcast, I've switched back from two monitors to three monitors. Now it will. You have to unplug like at least one of the displays to get it to boot. I've never been able to solve it. I've done a, a VBIOS update of the GPU to the mm-hmm. latest versions. I've oh, it'll it'll be a BIOS compatibility issue yeah. for sure. That's absolutely addressable. This is the problem when you go on these sort of niche workstation platforms and spend so much money doing it. Is it's not mainstream. So there's not, you know, if if it was a mainstream problem, you'd you'd end up with, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand times more people that could run into that issue and then report it. Yeah. And so the chances of that getting fixed are much higher. But you might be one of the few or only person that's run that specific configuration and had that problem. And it's like, good luck. The solution is to spend more money. So you have to buy a different graphics card and try that. So yep. yeah, they can be very painful. And that, that's what we found. And this this isn't unique to AMD. It can also happen on the Intel side. And we even saw that with Intel's HEDT platforms. They often had weird problems. I think the last one I looked at had USB issues galore. That's just not a mainstream product. Yeah, which is frustrating when you spend that amount of money. And mm-hmm. it's even more frustrating because, you know, we are not you know, as content creators that mainly do video editing in these types of applications, we're not the core audience for a product like this. So Mm -hmm. again, most people buying something like this will be doing much more significant CPU processing, things like code compilation and 3D rendering and things like that. But at the same time, Premiere does benefit from more than 16 CPU cores. If you have 24, 32 CPU cores for some applications, it can be beneficial to have a product like this, especially with the additional memory uh, support. You can simply have more RAM capacity Mm -hmm. as well as having more memory channels and memory bandwidth. It can help if you wanted to do a significant amount of warp stabilization all at the same time, which is something that is very common for our workflow here. Um, You know, that, that, you know, if you decide to do CPU rendering as well, which I tend to find does deliver slightly better results if I'm doing something like a, you know, a GPU quality comparison, something like an FSR3 video, I'll tend to prefer CPU encoding because it does tend to produce slightly better image quality. And again, having 32 CPU cores instead of 16 makes that a mm-hmm. more performant task. It runs faster, mm-hmm. but I don't really require the additional PCIe lanes. Like I'm running one GPU, I'm running a capture card, I'm running a 10 gig networking card because the motherboard didn't come with 10 gig networking and a couple of SSDs. I don't need 48 PCI 5.0 lanes. I certainly don't need 88 or 128 PCI 5.0 lanes. Don't really need quad channel memory. It's not really super important for my workload, although the additional memory bandwidth is kind of nice. Certainly don't need the pro features or any of those things. Mm -hmm. It's just so expensive and there's issues. That said, I'm going to throw all of those complaints out because I'm very excited to upgrade my system to a Threadripper. Probably the 7970X, if I can get my hands on one, the 32-core model is probably Mm -hmm. all I will need. The 64-core model won't make too much difference to my workload. I think the Zen 4 upgrade in terms of single-thread performance will be massive for my workflow. Massive. Yeah, I think so as well. Yeah, well, we moved to the 7950X 3D um, for our systems for editing, and it was a noticeable improvement for just general scrubbing through the timeline. Uh, and even encoding performance isn't too bad either compared to the the 64-core um, Zen 3. Just got more bandwidth, um, you know, better IPC, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it'll be good to to get that on a higher core count CPU finally. Yeah, I think with my workflow, with the B-RAW files that I use, I've got a Blackmagic camera. B-RAW is slightly more uh, thread and like individual thread dependent than it is across multi, multi-cores. multi okay. It's a little, it, it uses fewer CPU cores to decode uh, when you're sort of like scrubbing through the timeline or encoding parts of the video than you would see from like H.264 or one of those codecs, which can be a bit better split across multiple CPU cores. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the time I'm finding these days, especially with, late, uh, I think recently I've reduced the, I increase the level of compression for the files mm-hmm. that I take from my camera, which increases the decoding 
power that you need. It's tended to throw up a few more like single call limitations for my workflow than what I was seeing previously, which I think will be alleviated pretty significantly with the massive gain from like Zen 2 to Zen 4 in terms of IPC and things like that. I would mm-hmm. expect that my workflow for just editing and things will be a lot faster. And I'm hoping that some of the just random issues that I've come across will, yeah, maybe I'll get different issues and it'll be just as frustrating, but I'm hoping that the overall experience will be a bit faster. Like even things just like browsing through the, you know, just file systems and things like that is getting a little bit, okay compared to like my 7800X3D gaming system that I use for mm. testing, like mm-hmm. that zips through file systems you know, sending stuff to my NAS, like loading it is just like, boom, it's there, done, loads all the files, super easy, just a little bit sluggish on the Threadripper system. So yeah, I'm not sure whether I'll be willing to spend $2,500 US on the CPU, $1,000 US on the motherboard. Um, hopefully they'll, we can, we can convince AMD to send one and I'll build a system or something, but, um, good luck. Yeah. Good luck on that. Maybe I'll just have to go with the 7950X and sacrifice some of that <laughs> stuff. But yeah, so but, I don't know whether I call this a mixed bag because it does look like an pr- impressive performance improvement, but I guess mm-hmm. it's just some of the, our personal experiences using Threadripper that makes me a little bit more, mm. I don't know, would you say like lukewarm about it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, well, the last two releases have left a bit of a bad mouth in my, uh, bad mouth, a bad taste in my mouth. I'm getting tired, Tim. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It's like 10 <laughs> o'clock now, so getting tired. It's been, um, it's been a long day. Yeah, so probably a good time to have a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about, well, I want to know what you've been doing, why you were spending so much time outside today. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, Steve, hit me with the news. What have you been doing outside? You you told me earlier that you started at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. That's way too early. I'm well out of it at that time. Well, I had to make the most of the weather window and obviously I have to get back to work at some point. So I took the day off. I was planning on utilizing the day to its fullest. Uh, but yeah, as you know, I've got a fairly large deck at the back of my house. So, um, it's like 10 meters by 15 meters. And then because uh, we're on sort of a hill, you can access half of that underneath. And it's always just been a bit of a mess. Haven't really done anything with it because I've had other things to deal with. And this summer we thought, you know what, we're going to convert that to like a, a storage area, like kind of like a, a, a car garage type deal for, for putting things like UTVs, skid steers, mowers, all that sort of stuff. So I've had a 15 meter by four and a half meter slab laid. So that's good. That's gone well. And now I'm just, you know, it, it, the deck already had a roof there. Uh, so, you know, rainwater that went through the timber on the deck wouldn't end up under there. But I've added a second one so I can put in lighting and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite a bit of work to do that. A lot of welding up and framing and stuff. As I said, probably probably go to the Harbour Unbox Discord if you're interested because it's just, it's a very difficult to explain what I'm doing. But it's a weird conversion. I'm I'm building like what will end up being like a massive shipping container uh, looking type thing under the deck. So just a, a big steel box. But so the roof's done now. So that's finished. Uh, I've wired up a couple of the lights. I've got a few more to do. Uh, I think there's going to be seven in total. I've done two. So more just a proof of concept type deal. Uh, but yeah, it's going well. Uh, I'm very stiff, very sore, very tired. It was a long day, uh, but I'm keen to to get back to it. Are you going to hit it up again uh, tomorrow? The weather, at least at my way, is supposed to be pretty good tomorrow as well. Yeah, I'll spend a I'll spend some time on it tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure how much, and I'll see, it, it'll come down to how much time I have that I can spend on it away from doing my actual job, and how much time my body will allow me to do it. I, I could wake up with a very stiff back tomorrow, so we'll we'll see how things go. Yeah, no, honestly, I think you've explained it pretty well in terms of like I looked at the photos. I'm mm-hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense based on on what you were sort of describing. Yeah, again, more storage is always nice to have, so you kind of mm-hmm. got that quite handy sort of area under your desk and just, yeah, making the storage area to mm-hmm. prevent spiders from your entering your mower, as you sort of said earlier, which, yeah, again, yeah. my mower is not in a situation like that. So often there are spiders yep. and stuff I have to contend with, fight them off, you know, do yep. some karate chops and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I, I have a lot on mine. So it'd be nice to park it in more of a an enclosed garage because it'll have like, you know, an electric garage door opener and all that sort of fancy stuff. And It'll be it'll be a bug free zone. So I put well, the mower away. 
I'm interested because I know you have a pretty large mower. Mm-hmm. How are you going to fit all that stuff in? Are you just going to stack them like behind each other? Because you're saying you're going to put like a skid skier and, and trailers and stuff in there. Are you um, going to just have like the mower at the front and then those things at the back? So if you want to get something out, you have to drive them all well, out? Or it's four and a half meters wide, which is pretty wide. Okay. So like, I could fit a car in there and probably drive my 60-inch mower past it. Uh, okay. But yep. the skid steer and the mower will fit side by side, no dramas. I mean, you... Okay, so not as big as I was thinking because yours is, your mower is yeah. a lot bigger than mine. So It's 60 inches. It's got a 60-inch deck and it's wider than the skid steer. So, okay, um, yeah, neither to of them f- occupy four and a half meters. Yeah, to be fair, my mower is a 48-inch deck. Again, which we're getting into mower and gut and uh, lawn mowing talk. I mowed my lawn earlier today and that was great. I very much enjoyed it. The weather was awesome. And it's what was it? It's fun. What was interesting is that we did actually get a few comments on the podcast last week saying that they actually do enjoy talking about Boeing, which yep. maybe they're being sarcastic and, and having us for a laugh because I don't think talking about mowing is all that interesting, even what? though I do actually am now a mower person and have yep. to mow my lawn and actually do enjoy driving around a ride on at Well, I, I influenced your mower purchase, didn't I? Yes. So for, for, all, the, the, for all the mower enthusiasts in our audience which we believe is plentiful <laughs> uh i have a u.s made mower and so does tim now it is a hustler and mine's a hustler x1 so mm-hmm. it's my second hustler x1 i've had in about 15 years my other one my next door neighbor has and, and he's getting good use out of it but i just decided after having that one for about seven or so, probably a bit longer than that i don't know how long i had it for a long time it was still working fine i thought you know what? i'm gonna get another one this thing has been awesome i, I want a newie so I got another one. It's a few years old now. St- hasn't skipped a beat. The old one was bulletproof, still working well. So I, I speak quite highly of them. And then Tim bought a, a I want to say like a fast track. I've got a Raptor XD. Oh, Raptor. Okay, cool. Yeah. A Raptor. I can't quite remember if it's the XD Matt, or some uh, other uh, uh, Tim's Tim's one's a, a cute little one. So <laughs> is, yes. It's a good mower though. It's got a, yeah, I believe it's the Raptor XD with a 48 okay. inch deck. Okay. Um. So yeah, it's, it's been pretty good. I, did have one part break on it very early that was fixed okay. just under warranty pretty easily that the mower guy was pretty surprised broke. But anyway, it was, was pretty much I a non-issue. I wasn't but, when you got it. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just I, was, and I wasn't even crazy driving or anything. It was just flat land, just something happened. But apart from that, okay. it's been, yeah, really, really good actually. It's very powerful and gets through even the times that like today I kind of forgotten to mow the lawn for a couple of weeks. And there's been a few rain and stuff that hasn't played nicely with the the timing so there's been a few um longer than i would have liked sections of the lawn that had to be mowed over get through them no problems and obviously being zero turn as well my garden has kind of got more complex uh it's very landscaped yeah yeah there's a lot of like garden beds and stuff that if i had like a tractor style mower just wouldn't get around those areas very effectively so the zero turn was a must and yeah it's been yeah it's been really good and Mm -hmm. It's pretty. I like to eventually get some like trailers and stuff for it to mm-hmm. haul some some branches and stuff have fallen down around my place during the the winds recently, and it'd be nice to pile mm-hmm. those up using using the power of it. But yeah, that's that's the mower discussion for this week. Talking about our ride on mowers, and, and I'm sure we like can. That. Yeah, we we can pick it up next week. We'll we'll no doubt have a lot of questions about them that we'll we'll yeah. have to address in the in the next uh, podcast. But yeah, I think you you had a uh, a good recommendation from the mower. It's um yeah, yeah it's well, been. You're good for me, for sure. Be, been working uh, very well. The one thing that I did this week um, is I did a bit of cooking. Cooking? <laughs> You've tried cooking? Uh-oh. I actually can cook, so that's not not so much trying cooking. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I had some on my – at my ha- house, I think I've mentioned it a few times in the past, I've got quite a few, like, fruit, fruit trees, vegetables, and things I've been growing. And my orange trees had all these oranges on it for quite a while. I've been they sort of – very slowly using them for a few things here and there. But I decided, you know, I'm going to harvest all these oranges and make marmalade, which I'd never made before. Mm. And so, yeah, I gave it a try. I got, I way, made way too much, like a ludicrous amount that I could never feasibly eat in a reasonable amount of time. Because I was like, I harvested all the oranges. I'm like, oh, there's quite a significant pile here. I'll just make marmalade from that. And then I started reading the recipes and I was like, oh, so they're asking for like, one kilo of oranges and I have like over three kilos and they're already suggesting this is going to make a lot. So 
Yeah. So anyway, I've got now quite a bit of marmalade. It turned out okay. I think that I've learned some things if I was going to do it next time, um, but it worked. So that's better than it being a total disaster and a fail. So yeah, my partner helped out with some of the preparatory work for marmalade because you've got to do a lot of like processing of the oranges. You can't just throw them whole into a pot and hope for the mm. best. You have to mm-hmm. cut them up and do things like that. But yeah, it worked. I'm enjoying it. And yeah, it sort of was an interesting weekend project with a bit of spare time, like just putting things on the into a giant pot and boiling it for hours upon end while I go do some other things, come back and check on it. And yeah, it turned out well. Well, next week when you come for the q and it's actually probably won't next week, it'll be the week after. Anyway, w- whatever it is that you come to here for the Q&As, I expect some Tim's marmalade to be delivered. You want some? Yeah, because <laughs> I've made how many litres? I think I made... Th- over three liters okay. of marmalade. So you've got is, some to spare for me. I, I, I'm going to have to. We would. Um, my partner and I were joking about: Do we have enough friends and family that we know that we can palm off all this marmalade to? Tim, Tim's going to get arrested for having an illegal marmalade stand on the side of the road. Yeah, pretty much. I've got eight large jars and sixteen <laughs> small jars. So, <laughs> do you want a large or a small? Ah, uh, I'll go do you large. large. Do you like marmalade? Do you? I can't remember the last time I tried it, but yeah, I'm, I'm willing to have a go. I'm sure my wife would, would enjoy it. So. Sure. I'll, I'll make you sign a waiver so yep. that if you get sick from eating mm-hmm. it, you can't sue me because sure. I can't say, like, I tried my best, mm-hmm. but maybe mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, do the proper food safe methods for, you know, sure. yep. actually, you know, making I, jam I'm, and stuff. I'm well aware of the risks I'm taking here. So would you agree on this podcast right now not to sue yeah. me if you get sick eating my mum? I promise I won't sue Tim. Great. If I die, it's all. probably a bigger issue for you, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, that wouldn't be great. I'd feel pretty bad <laughs> if I made marmalade that was poisoned and gave it to you and then your you first, died. <laughs> your first thing is I'd feel pretty bad. <laughs> Pretty bad. Not, yeah. I mean, I you'd get over it quickly. Like the next product launch would probably yeah. distract you enough that you could move on. I'm not trying to elevate it to like total devastation in my life, mm, but I yeah. feel it's the, at the least pro- sad, right? Like, yeah, like if it was a four, t- if it was like an Intel 14th gen release, that wouldn't be exciting enough to help you move on quickly. So it would no. have to be like maybe hopefully what Zen 5 will be. So you just got to work on your timing there for when you give me the marmalade, I guess. Yeah, and unfortunately there's no like big product launches coming up that I no. can sort of palm off the marmalade, you die, and then I get over it. Yeah, probably, probably have somewhere to yeah, mid midway through next year, maybe or Yeah, but I'm not sure how long it'll last. So I think I'll just have to take the risk can, with you. Can you can is this a dumb can you freeze marmalade? Yeah, can you can. I mean I boiled yeah, okay. I, I boiled and sterilized it. So it should okay. it should be fine. Like it should, should it should be. last on the shelf for like a year. But Okay. That's theoretical. I've never made it before, so Maybe you can yeah. keep in the freezer or fridge. You'll have or to, you'll have to, yeah, date them and well, you know the date, but age them and see how it progresses. See, so, yeah, so that's right. The future. I can put some in the freezer, some in the mm-hmm. fridge, mm-hmm. some just left out in the shelf. See how it goes yeah. um, with the dates on them, and uh, yeah, but. Every time it, your partner walks in, you're like, "Try this." Just, just wondering. <laughs> well, what, what was funny is, uh, uh, my partner's not a huge fan of marmalade. Doesn't really like right. it. Okay. I was thinking. She was going to put in all this work and uh, hope for the best that our marmalade would be like super good so that it might change her opinion. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, here, it's finished. Like have a, have a sample of it. And she's like, nah, <laughs> no <laughs> way am I eating this. <laughs> so that was a little disappointing for her and me because we, we did spend a fair bit of time on it. But we do have a number of other fruit trees at our property that can be used for all sorts of different jams if we end up getting okay. to it. So, right. th- so there's a chance you can you've still you've, you've still got a chance to to make something that she approves of. Yeah, yeah. Like last year, we had a really massive amount of apples from our trees. Not that you can really make apple jam, sorry, something people do, but you can make other things with it. But this year, my apricot tree has been going off. Like it is mm-hmm. super laden with tiny green apricots right now. Okay. So I'm expecting a a really big haul of those and don't know if I'll turn to jam because turning into turns out making jam takes a lot of time. Uh, but so I'll find something, maybe I'll make some cakes yeah. or yeah. I'm not paying you to make jam, mate, unless it's good. <laughs> and then maybe we'll talk about it. Yeah, no, just, just a few side projects. Um, yeah, yeah. Interesting to have some, some fruit. Tre- Wait, do you have any fruit trees at your place? I know you've got like a, no. a You've got a veggie garden, don't you? Yeah, we've got a veggie patch, but haven't really gotten to the fruit trees. Look like a 
bit of work. I don't, I don't mm. know. I don't have time for that. If uh, we got like lemon trees and limes and all that sort of oh, stuff, yeah. but not not you know, yeah. Well, those count. Those count. Well, citrus counts. An orange yeah. is citrus, so it counts. Well, yeah. I mean, you can yeah, you can you can make lemon juice, I suppose, or lime yeah. juice, or, or it it hasn't been too bad so far. I've mostly just been like fertilizing it every once in a while, like mm-hmm. just every couple of months. Throw down some fertilizer. That's pretty much it. Doesn't take too much time. And then yeah, I've just been letting the exit like a. Things that people complain about with fruit trees has been like it dropping fruit onto the ground. Mm-hmm. And so it just makes this giant pile of fruit. I've just left it last year, <laughs> um, which d- doesn't really matter because I, yeah. it, like, I think if you're living in a smaller residential space and yeah. your backyard, you know, you don't want to have like a giant pile of rotting fruit that's just like just out your back door. But mine's sort of a bit further away and that doesn't yeah. matter all that much. So, well, I mean, it's same thing with it. the, yeah, it's same thing with lemons. We get them all over the place in the garden, but yeah, it's not near the house. It's like, whatever. Yeah. All good. So yeah, I'll keep people updated on my uh, garden and fruit trees as they come along. Um, a few things should be ripening up as we get more into to summer here. So yeah, should be a lot more updates on that. But yeah, I think that does it for the Hardware Unbox podcast for episode nine, I think it is. Good Who day. knows? Does the number even matter? We're in. We're, we're, we're keeping on doing podcast episodes. So, yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening to this one to the end. If you do want to submit your comments or feedback and you're listening to this via the audio version, the best way to do that is heading over to the video version on our YouTube channel, the Hard Run Box Podcast, and you can just chuck a comment in there. Or if you are a Hard Run Box supporter and you have access to our Discord community, we've got our podcast channel in there where you can – yeah, talk about lawnmowers and making jam and having fruit trees and building things. We actually do have a DIY channel, so people yeah. can talk about their projects in there. And yes, it's a lot of fun. So we'll be back next week. Thanks everyone for watching or listening. This is an audio version, isn't it? Audio, listening, and we'll see you in the next one. <laughs>